In the last video, we looked at the general linear algebra and the special linear algebra. And in particular, the special linear algebra corresponded to a family of Lie algebra that we label type A sub L. In this video, we're going to look at type B sub L, C sub L, and D sub L. And these four families are really important uh, in our study of Lie algebras, that in our, in our study of semi-simple Lie algebras, excuse me. Um, and that will become obvious as we uh, develop the theory. So the purpose of these two parts is to not have you completely internalize these things and understand every fact of them, but to recognize them as we move through our study. And uh, I think that it's it's that I, I feel that sometimes that it's unmotivated where these things come from, and so. Um, on one hand, I don't want to blame the book because that's kind of the presentation there. But on the other hand, I understand Humphrey's intention after going through the material. So this is kind of uh, on faith here that you're going to have to trust me that th this stuff will all come together. And so uh, with that being said, before we can look at types B, C, and D, we need to take a quick review of bilinear forms. So I'm kind of expecting that the viewer is familiar with the theory of bilinear forms that should have been part of your uh, adventures in linear algebra. And so I'll just recap it a little bit just for our needs here. So a bilinear form B on a vector space V over F is a bilinear map from V cross V into F. So it takes two vectors in V and sends it to some scalar in F. And the, the key part here is that um, it's, it's linear in each component. And so we say B is symmetric if B of V comma W is equal to B of W comma V for all V and W and V. Skew symmetric if B of V comma W is equal to minus B of W comma V. So skew symmetry and symmetry are the same thing in a characteristic two field. And then somewhat unrelatedly, uh, we say it is non-degenerate if the radical of B is equal to zero. Um, which means that the only vector, such that if you put zero, if you put that vector as the first argument, you get zero as your uh, the value of the bilinear form, no matter what you put in as a second argument. Um, and so zero would be the only vector satisfying that. And uh, yeah, so that would be a zero radical. Um, and well, I have to be a bit more precise. That would, what this definition here is really that of a left radical. Um, but because we're only going to be looking at symmet symmet symmetric bilinear forms and skew symmetric bilinear forms, um, the left radical and right radical are the same notion. So that's non-degeneracy. Um, and so recall that if we fix a basis for V, then the matrix of your bilinear form with respect to that uh, basis is given by just uh, pairwise um, bilinear forming them as a verb, I guess, uh, where the i throw in the jth column is just going to have the b applied to v sub i comma v sub j. So here I have the example n equals 2, right? So you have v1, 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 v2, v2, v1, v2, v2. And the reason this is important is because from the matrix of a bilinear form, you can recover the uh, bilinear form's action on any vector in the space. And this is because a, we know the value on the basis, and B, because it, it is a bilinear form. So we, we can use linearity to our rescue there. And so that's actually the segues right nicely into the, the next idea, which is that if we fix a basis for V, where V is finite dimensional, um, then there's a bijection between bilinear forms on V and N by N matrices with respect to that basis. So what that's saying is that if you give me a bilinear form, well, of course, it has its it has a matrix, and that's a unique matrix, and it's the only matrix, but it goes the other way, which is that if you give me a matrix, that corresponds to a unique bilinear form. Um, and so that will be a, a useful fact later on. And then another thing is the anti-diagonalization theorem, which will be relevant momentarily, which is that if B is a skew-symmetric and non-degenerate bilinear form on a vector space V, then there exists a basis beta for V in which um, the matrix of B is given by ones on the top half of the anti-diagonal and the negative ones on the bottom half of the anti-diagonal. Um, and so immediately, I, I didn't say it explicitly, but it becomes implicit that the dimension of V has to be even. So you can't have an odd vector space with um, 
uh, a non-degenerate skew-symmetric bilinear form. So that's kind of the summary of bilinear forms. Now let's take a look at type CL. Yes, type CL, we're going to skip over BL. We'll come back to that later. And so type CL is the symplectic algebra. And so you the, the uh, I guess, the reason we have um, 2L here instead of L plus 1 or N or something is because of the fact that we're going to define the symplectic algebra in terms of a non-degenerate skew-symmetric bilinear form. And so we already know by the anti-diagonalization theorem that can only exist when you have an underlying vector space that's of even dimension. So that's why you have a 2L here. So of course, there's always two ways of viewing these things. One is the transformation sense, one is the matrix sense. We'll start with the transformation sense. So V is a vector space over F, as I already explained, that it has even dimension. And so let B be a non-degenerate skew-symmetric bilinear form on V. Then we can define SP sub B of V is equal to X in GL of V, such that um, B of X times V comma w is equal to minus b of v comma x times w for all v comma w and v. And so this is this, the definition of symplectic algebra. And so once again, I, 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 the kind of the reader looking for, the viewer looking for motivation for this, um, I, I'm afraid I can't give it to you until we, we, we go later on. Or uh, also I, I kind of spoil some of the cool stuff that comes on later. So um, this is just the definition of the symplectic algebra. And so equivalently, as we saw in the, um, in the, in the bijection between bilinear forms and um, matrices, what we can do is we can fix a basis for V and we can look at SP2L comma F in the matrix world. So choose any invertible matrix in GL 2L comma F such that S equals minus S transpose. So the invertibility corresponds to non-degeneracy and then the skew symmetry corresponds to the condition S equals minus S transpose. So then we can define SP sub S 2L comma F is equal to X element GL 2L comma F such that S X equals minus X transpose S. So these two things are really the same condition, just phrased in different languages. And so one nice choice is S equals 0 I sub L minus I sub L 0. And then, so the reason we can choose S is because we could choose any basis we wanted to. And so this goes back to the anti-diagonalization theorem, which is telling us that, there, that any bilinear form that's skew-symmetric and non-degenerate can be written in this format here. So what ends up happening is that there's kind of this equivalence going on between regardless of what basis we pick and what bilinear form we pick, of course, as long as it's skew-symmetric and not generate, but the symplectic algebra can be represented in any number of these ways. The structure is the same, the naming is different. So one nice naming is using this matrix as our choice of S, and then that really highlights the structure of the symplectic algebra. It won't be obvious now, but when we study and the, um, go deeper into the theory of semi-simple Lie algebras, in particular the simple Lie algebras, so that's kind of a, a, a teaser of what we, we'll see later on, we'll see that choosing this choice of S really makes it clear what certain properties are um, that are obvious in sp 2 f that are important in the study of simple Lie algebras. And, and I, I know I haven't even defined what a simple Lie algebra is or what semi-simple is, so uh, please bear with me. Um, so, with this choice, I will just kind of see what it looks like. I once again, the, the, the it's more important just to introduce the definition here and be familiar with it. So as we move on, we we see what's going on, and we can recognize it when it pops up. So, the condition we want to satisfy is this, right? S X is equal to minus X transpose S. We want all X that satisfy that. So we're going to do as in the book, is write x in blocks, l by l blocks, m, n, p, q. And then if we do the multiplication out, what we realize is that we have sx is equal to this thing here, and uh, minus x transpose s is equal to that thing there. And so we get three conditions relating the blocks. Even though there's four equations, one of them, two of them end up reducing to the same thing. So um, 
we have P is equal to P transpose. So, so P equals P transpose, that, that fixes a restriction on our what numbers we can put in P. N is equal to N transpose, that puts a restriction on what numbers we can put in N. And then Q is equal to ne negative M transpose. So that puts a restriction on what numbers we can put in M and Q. So let's start with P, right? Let's just imagine P was a block matrix by itself. If you want the condition P is equal to P transpose, what that means is that, uh, let's just consider things off the diagonal, right? If I specify something above the diagonal, so let's, let's actually draw a picture here. If I specify something above the diagonal, so I put a A here, then I, in the transpose spot below the diagonal, I also need an A. So that means that if you specify E sub I J, then you need to also specif specify E sub J I. So this is kind of a basis vector like that. So you have to, whenever you have E sub I J, you need its companion E sub J I. However, now we notice that the block P has actually been shifted down by L. So we actually need to add L to the row. So that's where we get the first part of our basis here, right? I've added L to that. So it's E sub I comma J plus E sub J comma I, and then you add L. And then of course, there's also the diagonal associated with the P. That's much easier. It's just E sub I comma I, and then we need to add L because it's been shifted down. The second component is the N block. Um, and the n block is, satisfies the same thing, n equals n transpose. It's the same idea, except we do it to the column. So here I've added l to the column, to the I, uh, l to the column, and l to the column. So it's the same thing there. So that gives us a total of l times l minus 1 over 2 plus l here, and then l times l minus 1 over 2 plus l basis vectors. And so that's a total of l squared plus l basis vectors. Um, and then, of course, we have the middle one, which is the, the middle relation here, which is actually the easiest of them, which is Q equals negative M transpose. So that what that means is that whatever we fix for M, um, we, we automatically determine Q. So we can, whatever we choose for M, we get it for Q. So that's just if I say E sub I J describes M, because look at the indexing of I and J, they go from 1 to L not 1 to 2L. So um, we describe M, and then we just need to subtract out. Um, we, we, we put a minus sign here because of this minus sign. We put a transpose here because of, like that is we swap J and I because of this. And then we add L because, because Q has been, not only has it been shifted down by L, it's been shifted right by L. So that gives us an additional L squared basis vectors. And so we have a total of, uh, two L squared plus L basis vectors. And so the dimension of the symplectic algebra uh, as a subalgebra of GL of two L comma F is equal to two L squared plus L. So um, I, I wanted to go through this example of the computation. I'll, I'll breeze through the rest. I'll leave those to be done by the, the viewer. And so, um, this is the symplectic algebra. So just keep these things in mind. Um, now we can take a look at the orthogonal algebra in the even case. And so that is type BL. So in the, it's defined similarly. It's going to be defined in terms of a bilinear form, except this time it's a non-degenerate symmetric form. So what we're doing is we're, we have the same condition. It's everything X element of GL of 2L plus 1 comma F reason is 2L plus 1 is because this is the odd orthogonal algebra, such that Sx equals minus X transpose S. Here we're ch saying that um, uh, S is equal to this symmetric matrix, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, IL, 0, IL, 0, where the IL, of course, is the L by L identity matrix. And so this is a block matrix. It's not a 3 by 3 matrix. It's actually 2L plus 1 by 2L plus 1 matrix. And this is um, symmetric, whereas opposed, our last choice was Q-symmetric. Remember, S is equal to 0, I, L, minus I, L, 0 in our, um, in our, in the, in the previous example versus C, L. And so we can do the same thing, and uh, we can compute a basis, and we, we'll get these basis vectors. And so I'll leave it to the, the viewer to, uh, verify this, but, um, What's important here is that the dimension is 2L squared plus L, which is the same thing as type CL. And uh, it turns out that as we study this, we'll see that there is a uh, duality between type BL and type CL. That's really nice.
So this is the odd orthogonal algebra. This is another important class of, of Lie algebras, of linear Lie algebras. The next type is type D sub L. So type D sub L. So type D sub L is the even orthogonal algebra. So rather than 2L plus 1, we're just working with 2L. And it's the same idea as before with the bilinear form, except we're just changing S. So this time S is going to be, once again, a symmetric matrix because the orthogonal algebras are always defined in terms of symmetric bilinear forms. And so um, it's just ones along the anti-diagonal here. And so it's uh, this is type DL. And again, you can compute a basis. I actually worked this one out because it's not too hard. Um, and what you deduce is that uh, it's 2L squared minus L in dimension. And so it's a little bit smaller than the others with respect to L. All right, so those are um, our four classical Lie algebras. Um, and so as we, as we study more, that we realize that these things kind of become really important building blocks for our uh, study of semi-simple Lie algebras. And so uh, that's why we introduce them now. And we'll see more stuff as we go on with them later. So there are actually a few more important um, subalgebras of GL of V, or GL of N comma F. And those are the upper triangular matrices, the strictly upper triangular matrices, and the diagonal matrices. So I won't spend too much time on these. Um, the upper triangular matrices you, you're probably familiar with are just any matrix that has entries on the upper trying on the upper diagonal, uh, excuse me, on the diagonal and anything above it. So like this and anything above it. And this, of course, has a basis given by E sub I J where 1 is less than or equal to i, less than or equal to j, less than or equal to n. The strictly upper triangular matrices are a subalgebra of the upper triangular matrices, and they're, so they're strictly upper triangular, so it's strictly above the diagonal, so you have zeros along the diagonal, and then it's strictly above it. And so a basis is e sub i j, where 1 is less than or equal to i, strictly less than j, less than or equal to n. And then lastly, we have the uh, diagonal matrices. The diagonal matrices, of course, everyone knows these. It's just anything with um, a diagonal entry, with entries, excuse me, that are only diagonal. And so um, this has a basis E sub I, I, where 1 less than or equal to I, less than or equal to N, right? All right. Um, and so what's an interesting fact here is actually, um, uh, well, I'm not sure if I should introduce this. I, I, think, I think I'll introduce this uh, notion in the next video. So um, I think we can, we can end it here. I'll just kind of summarize it with the hierarchy table I made, and then we can call it a day. Oh, this is a, maybe a bit too big for the screen. All right, so this is just the hierarchy of what things look like. So um, SP 2N comma F and O 2N comma F symplectic and orthogonal are contained in SL 2N comma F, which is contained in GL 2N comma F. Uh, I forgot to mention that if you if you check the traces of the symplectic algebra and the orthogonal algebra, you realize that they are in fact all trace zero, and so they're actually contained in the in the special linear algebra. And so in the in the odd case, SP 2N plus one of F again, we have the same relation here. And then in general, the strictly upper the triangular matrices are contained inside the upper triangular matrices, which are contained inside the um, general linear algebra, and the diagonal matrices are contained inside similarly. And then lastly, the strictly upper triangular matrices are also contained inside of SL, the special linear algebra. So that's our hierarchy, and that summarizes our uh, look at the classical Lie algebras. Um, and so uh, that should conclude this part. Thank you for watching.